Welcome back as we close this week of Daily Devotions. My name is Danny Strange. I'm the pastor at Three Crosses. And thank you so much to all of our guest speakers this week. We had Larry come through, Lindsay come through, Ryan G come through to talk about Lamech and Cain and Abel and the people of Noah. On Monday, I launched the series talking about Adam and Eve. We've been looking through the characters of the Old Testament, linking with our Sunday series that we started on the life of Joseph, just kind of looking at the book of Genesis to say, what is this motley crew of folks that we see coming through the pages of scripture as we read Genesis 1 through Genesis chapter 50? And so thank you so much to those of you who shared with us this week. It was so fun for me to be able to see the devotions and not have to do them all the time. I'm going to close out our week in Genesis 11 today. And then next week, we're launching in for part two of this series. So more characters in Genesis. I'm going to jump in on Monday so you'll see me there. Come on back with us next week. Listen to this. Next week is our last week of everyday daily devotions. And so we've been trying these last couple weeks to get you all ready uh, for the inevitability that someday is coming uh, in June when we will no longer be gathering every day for these devotions and you're gonna have to figure it out on your own. And so if you've missed some, good news, you can go back on YouTube and watch the rest of them. But I'd encourage you, if you're looking forward to jumping into the text by yourself, Start with the book of John. Start on June 1st, read John chapter 1, study it, and do the things that we've taught you to do in the midst of these last 50 or 60 days. Look at the text. Look for the movements of the text. Look for what it says about God, about people, about the gospel. What is it saying to your life? Take some notes. Do some assignments. If you want to do that in a group, grab some friends. Keep this practice going in your life because the luxury of having someone step into your house and do it for you is ending next week. So we'll be back on Monday. If you're on YouTube, hit subscribe. We'll keep pushing these to you. If you're in the chat room today, say hi, and we'll see you again in a couple days. But today, we're jumping into Genesis chapter 11. You know, as I built the last two weeks of these devotions, I kind of cherry-picked my favorite passages. And so Genesis 11 is actually one of my favorite passages in Genesis because there's a really cool story about human progress and this complexity of God's response to the progress of a nation. So this is Genesis 11. If you've never heard the story, I'll give you the context. It says, as it starts, that the whole world had one speech, one language, and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And they said, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches the heavens so that we might make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered on the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if, as, if these people, speaking the same language, they begin to do this, then nothing they do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. One of the things that I like to do as I approach a text of scripture is kind of ask, okay, what do I see the first time I approach this text, right? No matter what, right? So the first time I approach this text, I see some things that don't make a lot of sense to me, right? It looks like there's a people who are trying to recover from this flood story and figure out life. They find a place to live. They've got the technology to make a great city. They say, let's hunker down. Let's build something great. And God seems kind of scared of the progress humanity is making, and so God says, let's look down here. Oh no, they're doing too much. I don't want these people to get too much power. Let's topple their tower. Let's change their languages. Let's make life hard for them because I don't want human beings to be great. And I read that and I think, this doesn't really match up with the God that we see everywhere else in the book of Genesis. It seems like God is always promoting human flourishing. It seems like God is not in the other chapters of Genesis trying to quench progress. It seems like God is trying to quench sin and rebellion and terrible things. The flood was destroying sin. But now it looks like God is trying to stop human beings from progressing in this world. The question comes up, is God opposed to human progress? No, I don't think God is opposed to human progress. In a sense, though, I think one lesson that can be learned from this text is related to the the way that we view human progress as humans. 
I don't know if you've ever heard about the concept of progressivism. This is kind of the era that we live in now, which is really connected to with the technological revolution that as human beings, there's something in us right now as a community that believes that if we can just keep making progress, make bigger things, build stronger bridges, build bigger towers, build better technology, develop YouTube and Zoom and phones and all that. If we can just progress as a people, we will finally find utopian fulfillment. And I think right now we're all experiencing that we've got a lot of technology and yet life still stinks a lot, right? And so I think there's something in here where God is saying the way that you view the role of progress in your fulfillment is not going to fulfill you. God's got a bigger picture of what he has in mind for the human race. Yet at the same time, as I read this text a second time, I, I start seeing some red flags popping up about what humanity is doing. The first I see is a literary red flag. It says in, in verse two that the people were moving eastward. And we know that in the Old Testament, Pastor Buzz told us this a few months back, whenever the Bible describes people moving eastward, it's a literary device that shows that they're moving away from the plans of the Lord. So there's something that's supposed to tell us as the reader, "Uh uh-oh, they're doing something wrong here. The next thing we see is that they find a plain in Shinar and they settle there. And that should be another red flag that, okay, hold on. God has, has this promised land for his people And there's this picture throughout the Bible of this land and this people and this promise and this blessing of God. And it seems like these people are stopping short of the vision that God has given his people. So maybe they're settling for too little in terms of settling down in Shinar. We see another red flag in the people in in verse 4 where it says, Let's build a tower, let's build a city so that we may make a name for ourselves. And we as Christians say, okay, hold on, we know that Christians and God's people are not supposed to make a name for themselves. They're supposed to make a name for God. So there's a red flag there. And and then we see after that, our fourth red flag, they say, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Now, the reason that this is a red flag is because when God comes in, he ultimately scatters them over the face of the whole earth. So they were trying to oppose the plan of God. And even as we go back to the beginning of this week and we look at the Genesis 1 and 2 account and even the Genesis 3 account of the Garden of Eden and God's mandate on humankind, God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so in Genesis 11, we see people who are settling for less of God's plan. They're trying to use technology to make a name for themselves, to try to make human progress, to try to hunker down in one place where God has said, no, 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 no. My mandate for you as people is not to make one city and live in this little island on the planet. My vision for humankind is that you would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and rule over it and subdue it to every corner of the globe. I see. I think we see something in human nature in Genesis 11 where these people feel like if they can just hunker down and build something great and build a utopian vision for their lives, they will be happy. It's kind of like maybe the beginning of the shelter in place season. Maybe you had a Babel experience, right? Where you said, you know what? I'm here with my family. This is amazing. We're going to make this great. We're going to hunker down in our home. We don't need anybody else. We don't need to leave. We're going to make a utopia right here in this little place. And you realized pretty quickly that it's very difficult or impossible to build a utopia in your home with never leaving. God has designed you to be in relationship with those around you. God has designed you to travel and make his glory go into these places where you go. God has designed you to be salt and light in the world. The, the life you're living right now, stuck in your house with a few people, no matter how great you make it, is never going to fulfill you because you were created for the mission of God. I had a professor in seminary who said we always look at Genesis 11 like God brings his judgment and scatters them. But according to all of Genesis, this is not God's judgment. This is God fulfilling his mandate for the nations. God has said, stop hunkering down in one place and go reach the world. Fill the world. Go to the ends of the earth. We see Jesus say the same thing in Matthew 28 with the Great Commission, right? Go and make disciples of all nations. Paul says this in Romans. Go, send people, share the gospel, bring the gospel. Go to the ends of the earth. The vision God gives us is very different than the vision humans have of utopian fulfillment. The people in Genesis 11 have a picture of a utopia, which is a little city in one place with a big tower where all the people with one language can dwell. Where God's picture of a utopian vision and the kingdom of God on the other side of the return of Christ is a world that is filled 
with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, worshiping Jesus, covering every corner of planet Earth in a utopia that is ruled by God, that has his name on it, not our name on it, that fills the entire globe with a diverse and beautiful group of worshipers. The people were settling for too little when they hunkered down in one city. They were settling for too little when they wanted to make a name for themselves. They were settling for too little when they wanted to use technology to just make their city great. God said, I want you to go and reach the world. And it's interesting, Genesis 11 has a very different uh, vibe than Genesis chapter 12, where in Genesis chapter 12, God finds Abram that is hunkered down in his country, and he says the opposite, as the people of Babel says. He says in 12.1, the Lord says to Abram, go from your country, go from your people, go from your household, from your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I encourage you today, if you want something to do, to read Genesis 11, then read Genesis 12, and see the difference of vision from what the people had in the Tower of Babel to what God gave to Abraham when he says, leave the place you're comfortable, go to another place, and create a society that will bless all nations of the world. There's a blessing I have, God says, for all the nations, every tongue, tribe, and nation of the world, and I want to create a community that doesn't hunker down to make themselves great. I want to create a community that blesses to the ends of the earth. You know, we're fortunate to be part of a church that believes that. We do not believe our church exists to build a monument for our own comfort. Our church exists to reach people for the name of Jesus all over the East Bay and to the ends of the earth. And so the partnership that God has given you to have with him in this globe is one that does not make your name great. It is not building an empire for yourself. It's not building a comfortable community where you can be happy. God's mandate for you is the same as he had on Adam and Eve and the people of Babel and even Abraham where he says, I want to bless you so that you can bless the nations. Think about that today. I want to pray for us as we close our week and then we'll move into our weekend. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would use us to reach the world. Thank you for our missions program at the church that does just that, that partners in a network with with church planters and pastors around the globe, we pray that you would stir in our hearts to partner with your work there. We pray that you've, as you put us in this beautiful place in the East Bay that's filled with people from all over the earth, that you would extend our networks, that we wouldn't just hang out with our family, with our church folks, with people who look or act or talk or speak like us, but that you would use us to be a blessing to all nations, even as we don't leave the places where you've put us. We pray that you would do a mighty work in our lives through us and that we would be people who have a global focus, an outward focus, an others blessing focus, and we would never become individuals or a church or a community that's all about themselves, their tower, their buildings, or building a name for themselves. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great weekend.